Hello and welcome to our follow-up episode of The Blood of Zeus with uh, David Wright and myself. Formerly, you have seen us with Amy Pistone, who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight. But for our follow-up discussion, focusing in particular on the material world in Blood of Zeus, we have with us... I'm Kira Jones. I'm Zoe Elise Thomas. And without any more ado, here we go. The Blood of Zeus. So we're going to start with some of these production photos. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? All right. So uh, what we've got here is um, the three character designs from Powerhouse Animation of the three fates. So um, Clothos um, on the upper left, uh, Atropos, and on the bottom we have um, Lachesis. And what I personally love about these and um, you all can um, chime in afterwards, I hope, is the emphasis on textiles with these characters. Because, I mean, we all know they're weavers, that, that's their thing. Um, but they've got so much intricate threading in their hair. They've got these amazing shawls on. Um, they've got these really, really heavy, heavily pleated dresses. Um, so it, it ties in with um, their character roles a lot. Yeah, they um, and I'll I'll get. Get to my little um, and dress and the the fates, but um, uh, I also really like the way that their their clothing is so different from everyone else's clothing in the show. They definitely have a very distinctive representation of themselves, both in terms of their hairstyles, um, which uh, I love that they they grow. <laughs> As you get as you get older, as the fates get older in terms of um, uh, performed age, perhaps um, their hair literally gets bigger um, and more intricate, and the the general lowering of their eyelashes I find really interesting. Um, so Lachesis, of course, has those beautifully winged eyelashes that you know I wish I could accomplish. Um, versus Clothos, who's got the more kind of straight out towards her ears and then um, Atropos with her very long drooping ones. Um, interesting ideas with kind of the, the different stages of fate, I suppose. Um, I love that observation. And I was thinking with the idea of the pleats and the skirt, uh, the number of kind of wrinkles in the face that also rise and increase. So there's a combination between the way skin works and the way that textile works that is really kind of striking. Mm -hmm. So going on, we have another production photo here of Chiron and some architecture. So I, I adore Chiron in this show. Um, I think that he is fabulous, um, not just because he's got this like amazing beard. Um, and I mean, can we just take a moment to appreciate that beard? Because my God. Um, <laughs> it is it's like nice an animal goals. unto itself um mm -hmm. but you know his face is so different from the other centaurs in there the other centaurs really look like you know the rest of the humans um in the show and then we come to chiron and he's got this um it, it's almost like a silenus look um mm. to him um that really sets him apart as kind of like this older kind of patriarch um, of the centaur herd uh, and of course he's got all this bling on so he's got his gold horseshoes he's got um, his belt he's got his um, little parchment saddle carrying thing um, so I, I really love all the attention that they put into his character design um, but his house is pretty fabulous as well um, so I forget which episode it's in but um, Alexia goes to visit her former mentor Chiron uh, uh, that's establishing herself as a Greek hero um, to get this um, map of the labyrinth uh, deciphered because he's the only person who can read languages that old. Uh, and it turns out he's just living in like this Greek library paradise. Um, and what they've done is they've put a pretty traditional um, temple facade on the front of it. Um, so you can see here that um, we've got um, you know, the four columns in the front. We've got two statues. One of those is the Farnese Heracles on the left, mm. I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, um, yeah. We've got mm. a uh, 
rearing centaur um, up on the uh, the top of the pediment, lots of polychromy, and then you walk in and it's this um, series of terraces with um, parchment shells built in them. And, you know, we, we know that this is the actual kind of shelf that was used, um, you know, for scrolls. Um, we found some of them in Pompeii and I, I'm pretty sure that we have some of them on Greek vases as well. So um, the fact that they don't have just like random books lying around, um, which happens so often mm -hmm. in, in Greek cartoons um, is, uh, is really great. But they've also taken the time to make this into a space that a centaur can actually get around in. Um, so it's clear that it's Chiron space um, it's something that is built for him, for his needs, uh, but it also has all of these really uh, fantastic Greek aspects to it. Yeah, I love that. I had not thought about this space being like you need, you can't have a traditional like narrow shelving units at all. Like you need to mm -hmm. be kind of frontal, plenty of lawn to like back up on. Yeah, he's got a lot of caboose there that he needs to be. <laughs> Uh, so while we're on Chiron, can I ask your opinion about Chiron as Lando Calrissian? <laughs> Did you have any thoughts about that? I'm also realizing they're in the Ewok village there. They're in like this village in the trees. Yeah, there's yeah. A, lot, a lot going on here. I mean, I think similar to the Ewoks, there's a lot of... Um, I mean... I would say the the centaurs on on a whole in Blood of Zeus are a, a little less silly than Ewoks, but there's a Fair still enough. this idea of um, of natural wisdom, you know, like you've got your inherently natural uh, places, and that's where it kind of you know the more mystical, less you know, quote unquote heavy, quote unquote civilized things happen. Um, as for Lando Car. Carrizia and I have no opinion. <laughs> That's fine. I'd say it works. Uh, I mean, he's kind of the pseudo father figure, um, has a lot of connections, um, and he uh, totally betrays Alexia. Uh, I mean, he literally sits on her. There, you can't get much worse <laughs> than that. That's my favorite part, to be it honest. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, game also, over, Alexia. <laughs> I mean, I, I also have to say, as resident um, grown-up horse girl, that's terrifying. <laughs> it's probably oh. hands down the scariest thing in this show is having <laughs> an entire horse pin you to the ground like that. So then we need to admire Alexia even more for getting back up after that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, Thanks for pointing best. out the, the Farnese Heracles there. I, I had noticed that. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's interesting, like having Heracles, who's traditionally the enemy of the centaurs, yeah. uh, in in front of the temple here. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking for, you know, contradictions. But, I yeah. mean, you, you could kind of position it as like, you know, Seraphim and his cohort are coming in and being the bad guests, like Heracles was. Mm, um, I like that. Yeah. Mm. And in a way, like having Heracles there, it's a way of controlling him because you've rendered him into stone mm. as opposed to the like chaos that is a living Heracles. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think there's, oh, whoops. No, 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 please, please continue. I was also gonna say, I think there's, um, there's another tension to this too, in that, uh, I mean, I think Centauromachy is pretty, um, a pretty common motif in Doric temples. And a lot of the, arche or the a lot of the architecture that's kind of built into the Centaur environment is all Doric. Mm. Um, so you kind of expect your metopes to have maybe a centauromachy, maybe a gigantomachy, maybe an amazonomachy. So um, mm. interesting kind of tension between yeah. location of where these Doric temple-esque places are being built and who's actually using them, um, I think is, is interesting. And instead kind of what we get on the inside is a combination of all three of those things that have been removed from a pediment to the conflict between giant related demons there's the amazon of alexia and then there's the centaurs in there so it's like they've all been yeah. removed from the pediments and they're living their battles yeah and we've got the philosopher statue on the inside too right yeah yeah i would also kill for his saddle like parchment holder <laughs> i would love that that would be so great the horse girl horse girl scholar dreams <laughs> <laughs> be a centaur 
have a scroll side saddle, mm -hmm. saddle bag. And do you want the golden hooves, horseshoes? <laughs> no, the materialist in me says gold is not what you want on your horseshoe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, so moving on, we're going to talk about some hair. Yeah, so this is, um, we're getting into my ha -ha, hair brain schemes. Um, so something that I was just really struck by is the, um, uh, I guess, kind of what I was expecting when I went in to go watch Blood of Zeus, because it presents itself as this, um, you know, old forgotten tale the very beginning there's that wonderful you know these are all oral traditions and some things got lost along the way and this is one of those stories um and for some reason that set me up to expect more bronze age designs um uh maybe i've just been playing too much assassin's creed odyssey but um i was really struck by the number of classical designs but also the number of hellenistic designs and of course those are obviously very distinct time periods in Greece. Um, and one thing that that struck me in particular is the, the fabulous curly, lush hair um, that Alexia and other characters have as well, um, which of course just makes me think of Alexander the Great. So um, I had to put up the the iconic uh, Alexander the Great, his, his beautiful mane of hair. Um, and I think, I mean, it's, I, even if the intention or the parallel is unintentional, I mean, she's got, Alexia's got those beautiful like forehead curls that come down. Um, her they face seem to map on directly. Like this, right, this yeah. S, this S faces. curl over the left shoulder and this one. Is, like, it's, is mm -hmm. that called the anastole? What's the anastole? It's a Alex Yeah, that's thing, like right? the, the cowlick thing that happens like right at Sandra, it was forehead there. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the iconic. Yeah. Uh, and, and her face is framed so nicely by, by her curls as well. Um, but I find it, you know, it's just a really interesting visual parallel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if, if you go to the next slide too, I think it holds true for Heron as well. Um, and a less, I mean, this is like a great mosaic of Alexander just cause his eye is so, <laughs> got those big eyes. Um, uh, but he too has that kind of like curly, quaffed, um, very, very well framed look um, that I found that I think is, is interesting. It definitely portrays both of them as, as I mean, if, if they are analogs for Alexander the Great in terms of visual comparisons, um, really sets them up to be the heroes, you know, compared to Seraphim, who's got, you know, long, long luscious hair and it's not nice and framing his hair his face nicely and stuff like that so. yeah i don't think we pulled up um an image but a lot of people re remember it but he's at that long blonde the white the white hair that hangs down so mm -hmm. really strong contrast yeah that's that's awesome i love this yeah yeah i also think that there's a good amount mm -hmm. of like um juriferous uh physiognomy in heron mm -hmm. um which of course links him back to like this whole classical um, tradition of anatomical perfection, which you would expect from a demigod. Um, but, you know, maybe a little bit of Lysippus in there too. So uh, I can definitely see the Alexander connection. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of good parallels too, because um, about his, like his proportions, because the show is obviously interested in the proportions of Heron because he's frequently juxtaposed to his, like the god, siblings and how little mm. he is but he's still so proportional and so there's a sense I think there of equivalencies as you yeah one of my favorite things was when um they were training on Olympus Zeus Zeus and well Heron was training Zeus was yelling at Heron while he was training but there's this wonderful scene where Zeus kind of like hunkers down and leans over so that he can actually look in Heron's face and I thought that was really um a nice touch. Uh, so it looks like we have some more hair. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I got a little carried away. Um, again, trying to find these Bronze Age connections, uh, or I guess I was will willing them into the show, um, a bad archeology span uh, trait. Um, but something that I thought was interesting is because like, I, like, like Kira mentioned, um, 
their hairstyles are so different from uh, the other hairstyles um, where they've got there's these kind of like woven bands that collect their hair into these long, not plaits quite so much, but long um, ponytails for lack of a better term that down their back. Um, and it made me think of this Mycenaean lady fresco, um, which is from Mycenae, um, where she too has this kind of banded hairstyle down her back. Um, it's also, I mean, hard to hard to see perhaps a direct correlation, but she's got that head a headband the Mycenaean fresco does compared to the fates. Um, mm -hmm. And the kind of, I mean, she's got curls along her forehead, but you know, could be perhaps and reinterpreted as those, sorry, I'm disappearing into Olympus behind me, uh -huh. um, as this kind of space buns, for lack of a better term, um, on space the top buns. of uh, the fate's heads. Um, so I just thought, you know, another interesting hairstyle and, and again, highlights the, the temporal difference between, and also the, the power difference between hair on and Alexia and mortals with their Alexander the Great hair versus um, these ancient unknowable beings <laughs> <laughs> and their <laughs> Bronze Age hairstyles. So. That's fantastic though. I had um, completely forgotten about that fresco, but it fits so well. Yeah, there's others where their hair is more free flowing. And so, mm -hmm. you know, naturally I selected the evidence that supports my thesis. <laughs> but, <laughs> You only need one to show up on a Google search when you're <laughs> looking for inspiration though, so. Exactly, right? <laughs> oh, and this just shows even more like how many different strands are coming together with the fates, right? We, mm. When we talked about this scene, we spent a lot of time thinking about all the different parallels that you could make to a contemporary knowledge. That was an excellent pun, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, it's, it was labored. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, like, I'm really stimulated, Zoe, by this observation that you're making of juxtaposing Hellenistic hair to Mycenaean hair. Yeah, I didn't get a picture, but there's also um, Bronze Age women in frescoes typically have these interesting kind of tasseled skirts or what we often interpret as tasseled skirts, um, which is an interesting comparison, too, with these wonderful uh, tasseled cloaks that the fates are wearing. So again, I, I'm willing, I'm willing the Bronze Age into existence in this show, but. Um. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for what your eye is seeing. That's, that's the joy. Uh, so we spent, yes. when we spoke, David, Amy and I, a fair amount of time on the striking nature of this image. But what we didn't spend enough time on is just how striking the previous image is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Take it away. So, I mean, there's many layers to this scene. Um, but of course, uh, we get most excited about the the tripod table and brazier behind the um, tripod group in the front. <laughs> so there's interesting, you know, 333 going on. Um, and uh, I figured it would be a good chance to take a little deep dive into tripods <laughs> throughout Greek history. <laughs> um, so if you go ahead and go to the next slide, there's a lot of them <laughs> and everyone feel free to like jump in. I'm not, I'm not uh, interested in, uh, well, I could talk about tripods all day, but I'm not interested necessarily in doing that. Um, so I found, first of all, um, several Bronze Age, um, uh, analogs <laughs> because I had to. Um, so the <laughs> one on the upper right is possibly a portable hearth. Um, if you zoom in on the brazier, which I didn't do on this slide, um, there's actually wood in it. So clearly some kind of like heating device um, that's fitted into a tripod stand. So the, the, the Bronze Age um, potentially portable altar slash round table on the upper right is kind of an interesting um, analog to that, but the more clearly the one that they're really drawing their inspiration from is the one on the far left, which is that um, ninth century bronze tripod cauldron. Um, and those are kind of the more, I mean, they're the more iconic famous ones. They're the ones we see more um, in classical art as well, which we'll 
we'll get to. I just had to, you know, start a little bit with Bronze Age. Um, and there we have a nice, on the bottom left, we have a nice uh, limestone offering stand. So not necessarily a table, but it's painted beautifully with these dolphins and um, kind of like a sea wave motif along the top as well. Um, and the one on the far right is kind of a, a, a fan, like a decorative stand that you might fit such a brazier into. Um, and I think next I have some linear B on here. Woo! <laughs> um, I will say also uh, I was shocked and surprised when cuneiform showed up on the map. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really interesting and cool. Um, naturally, I was offended that it wasn't linear B, but then I was like, you know what? It doesn't have to be Zoe. It can be <laughs> Other people can be involved too. <laughs> so. Um, but I mostly just wanted to put this up here because there's a really, uh, there's an ideogram in linear B for a tripod cauldron. So that's kind of, yeah, so that's it on the, on the tablet. This is tablet PY614. Um, it's actually one of the first, one of the first, if not the first that was ever um, translated by Michael Ventris. Um, anyway, I just wanted to include it because it's got that that nice little ideogram. Um, this tripod cauldron, of course, has those handles, which is what we see more often um, in kind of, you know, as as uh, rewards at the games and things like that. Um, and I think the next slide has some pictures of that. There we go. Beautiful. So, yeah, that's that more standard uh, um, tripods for, you know, doing really well in the games. Um, you know, maybe Kofi got one when he beat, when he won at the Pankration games, I don't know. Um, does anyone have anything to say about these wonderful circles and their handles? I love them so much. I mean, they're stunning. Um, <laughs> and I, I absolutely adore the Apollo Heracles story. Um, where um, Heracles um, goes to Delphi to get a prophecy from Apollo to figure out like how to get rid of all this blood guilt. And Apollo says, hell no, um, you are covered in blood guilt. You're not coming in here. I'm not talking to you. So Heracles says, fine, I'm going to take your tribe on and make my own oracle. And hijinks and Sue. Uh, eventually, I think it's Zeus makes um, Heracles give the tripod back to Apollo. Um, but... You know, the fact that they're including this tripod, like, right by his bed mm -hmm. <laughs> um, really underlines the importance of it to him. I mean, it, it's his main thing. It's in, um, integral to the Oracle at Delphi. Uh, it's a huge part of his iconography and um, clearly a, kind of a part of his sex life as well. So um, <laughs> I, I say good job for integrating it into his life. I, I have a, a kind of a noob, archaeological noob question. So... <laughs> Like I definitely like, learned about these in like an undergrad archaeology class, but like I got the impression they're more ornamental. I mean, like, did, like did they often serve a purpose for something, or was it more just like, hey, showy, we're dedicating this thing to the god at a at a sanctuary? Kira, do you want to take that or? Um, I can. Um, I, I think it depends on the tripod. Um, like the ones that we read about in the Iliad and stuff where they're just constantly throwing tripods all over the place, mm -hmm. um, like it's currency. Um, those ones were almost definitely ornamental. Uh, if you get a tripod made out of gold, you're not going to want to use it for cooking stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, I'm sure that they would have had like more utilitarian ones um, mm -hmm. as well. So what do you think, Zoe? Yeah, yeah, I... Um... I, I definitely agree with that. I'm trying to think of, I think we have some more utilitarian tripods from the archeological record. I can't think of any specific examples at the moment, but um, definitely a difference between your, you know, perhaps your fancy silverware that you only bring out when, you know, really important people come over. I'm trying to think of who I'm having over at my apartment right now, which is no <laughs> one. Um, the fancy silverware I give, I use for my cat when it's her birthday instead mm -hmm. of, you know, her usual little boring bowls. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm gonna further collapse some temporalities here. So Zoe, <laughs> you were going as far back as you could. I'm gonna go up 
<laughs> both, uh, both David and I work on Augustan poetics. Mm -hmm. And like for Augustus, Apollo is so important. The Temple of Apollo features a terra, very famous terracotta of mm -hmm. her Hercules in that context and Apollo wrestling over it. But what I mm -hmm. love about this is because if you think about like Augustan morality legislation, you should not be throupling <laughs> with Apollo. And so then we get Apollo up here having like defeated the um, barbarism of Hercules only to show us his like really vibrant, healthy sex life. So uh, turns out this scene is the most important. <laughs> yeah, petition to start calling threesomes tripods. <laughs> <laughs> Or threesome with the guy. I don't know. We'll think of something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, or we like rename the Ars Anatoria, the three volumes of it. The, yeah. There you go. Ovid's tripod. There we go. Ovid's tripod. <laughs> hey, maybe that's an unknown Augustine connection. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So also we'll have seen in the back, oops, in the background here, um, that there's several Amporai as well. And so mm -hmm. we have some parallels. Yeah, yeah. So I, those, those two pictures on the left are kind of the zoomed in versions from that screenshot. And then I also included a screenshot below that's um, from a different scene, um, which I also loved when Seraphim slices open the, the olive oil amphora, but has a little bit, you know, to give you a better idea of what the general form is. Um, I would say typically in the show, they tend to do, I mean, they tend to do much more um, kind of simple geometric designs on their amphorae and their pottery in general, whereas we might expect a little bit more if they're, if they're really in, if they're really embracing this um, classical Hellenistic uh, vibe, we might expect, you know, more red figure, black figure kind of um, kind of decorations, which you sort of get on that amphorae on the bottom, um, you know, where that nice, along the shoulders of the shoulders and the body of it, you get your nice little, you know, mythical scene or whatnot. Um, whereas in the amphorae in the, uh, the, the tripod scene, um, seem to have more close parallels with things like geometric uh, pottery. So that's what we've got on the right hand side. The far right is a very famous amphora um, from around 750 BCE. Um, and of course, you know, you can see why it's called the geometric period. Um, the amphora on the left is um, a much, much more simple amphora, uh, which is actually from Italy. It's from Cerveteri. So um, Etruscan uh, in, in fine spot. <laughs> and use, um, but kind of these, these more simple banded designs as opposed to, uh, you know, telling stories. Unlike the, um, the dream, amph the, there was like a dream pot that happened mm -hmm. uh, in, in one of the first couple episodes, um, which did have that very cool kind of simulated black and red figure decoration yeah. on it. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I would add that, um, uh, the pot at the bottom, which Aaron is slicing through, it's, um, uh, pretty typical, um, panathenaic shape, um, mm -hmm. which would have held olive oil. So, mm -hmm. um, we don't get like the really fancy Athena decoration that we would on an actual panathenaic pot, but, you know, the small handles, a short neck and the really wide belly that, um, has a figural design on it is pretty typical of the shape. Yeah. Now, that's great, which is just another way that like Heron having been gifted this blade cuts through tradition. And so it's like a whole swath of tradition. Mm. Yeah, and it's like, he, this is something that he would have gotten for like winning at the pan Games. Um, you know, the same way that you would probably not throw away a sword that Zeus made for you. You probably wouldn't <laughs> slice through your pan amphora. But Heron <laughs> so don't that, care. That, so that's really interesting because by not understanding that tradition, I think we can reread the scene when he's in the slave galley where he learns that Kofi had won the Pan Athenaic Games mm -hmm. if people were betting against him. And he's like, he doesn't really understand the cultural context that he keeps like throwing himself into. Mm -hmm. Well, and interestingly too, so this particular scene, it's actually Seraphim who's cutting the pot oh, open. Right. Okay. Um, but, but I think it's still, I mean, I think the point still stands, right? Seraphim, who's been 
abused and rejected by this cultural tradition Mm -hmm. um quite literally you know destroying it on his way to continue to try and destroy Mm -hmm. uncivilized demon yeah Yeah. and he's also not going to fight by people's rules before Mm -hmm. yeah I mean, it's interesting that we have the two brothers that are kind of both rejecting, you know, civilized tradition here, in a sense. Um, Seraphim to a greater extent, um, but, you know, I I think there's something to be said for, you know, kind of being, um, you know, apart from society and their own individual heroic roles, and then having to suddenly grapple with it um, when they get thrown into this heroic story. Yeah, love it. Uh, so we're going to make a from pottery to numismatics turn. So this coin really flustered me because I wasn't sure what it was supposed to represent. <laughs> um, and I clearly got a little hung up about it. So um, I decided that, I mean, so there's part of it, I think, is complicated by the fact that um, there's a couple mythic traditions that are getting smashed together, right? So the Acrisius in blood of Zeus is king of Corinth because Seraphim and Heron are the sons of the king of Corinth. Is that, see, this is, Mm -hmm. I'm not a mythology. (laughs) Mythology? Yeah, I think that's right. That's right, yeah. Um, but But in actuality, I mean, in Greek myth, Acrisius was king of Argos. Argos, Argos. Oh, uh, that's why I have a I have a coin from Argos on the slide. I was giving myself hints and I didn't even get them. Um, I mean, so both so both on the Pe- Peloponnesian Peninsula. Um, but so I first started by looking at pictures of Corinth, and I thought perhaps it might be trying to represent Acro Corinth, which is that rocky outcropping. Um, that's that's the the massive kind of mountain that's right next to lower Corinth, which is depicted in the foreground. Um, Another kind of harebrained thought I have is that it's supposed to be representing the Gulf. So there's Corinth, which is um, at least uh, later. So if you look down on the map, there's a later settlement of Corinth, which is from 1858, that's right on the coast. But that actual kind of curve almost looks like the little curve in the coin, um, but it doesn't match up with the rest of the coastline. So of course the Peloponnesian Peninsula continues on where that coin has sort of a, a little point. <laughs> um, I think uh, in reality, I, I obviously we don't know. Um, I looked up some coins from Corinth to see if there were any um, visual parallels. Uh, I did include a couple just because one has a Pegasus and it was nice with the Corinthian horses, um, which we saw in earlier episodes. Um, And then of course the Trident because Corinth was, uh, or closely associated themselves with Poseidon um, as a trading hub um, and being so close to the water. So a nice little, um, little mythological reference there. I also looked at coins from Argos thinking, you know, perhaps, perhaps they were drawing inspiration from um, Ar- Argos or the Argolid Acrisius. Um, but what I found, is, I mean, I, they don't, that's the, the short story, but I wanted to include this coin because it's got a nice representation of um, the, the way that coins were made. And so they were, they were pressed with a die, right? So hit with a die um, rather than molded. And so I thought it was interesting to look at that kind of, that enclosed A square, um, which represents Argos. And then on the coin that Zeus gives to Seraphim, you kind of get a sense that the center is actually more deeply depressed than the edges, cool. um, which I thought was, which I thought was a nice yeah. touch, right? Nice touch. Just a little bit of die studies going on in, uh, mm-hmm. in Blood of Zeus. Yeah. And it's clear the show is interested in like the physical idea of mercantilism because the first scene with Heron is him trying to get coins for like the mining that he has done. Uh, And then of course his mom, her passage to the underworld is paid for by coins. I love the way that you thought about this as, hey, like even though those seem to be birds, let's like try to rethink it and like step outside a little bit. I think that's awesome. (laughs) 
Uh, birds, waves, you know, they could be the same. Was that was the, thinking- mount- the mountain, though, that later where when Zeus tells Seraphim, oh, this is where your dad is? Like, remember, remember he had to go to some mountain? Was that it? Yeah. So he gives him this coin and he's yeah. like, Seraphim's like, what am I supposed to do with this? And okay. Zeus is like, ah, this is the where you'll find your vengeance <laughs> or something. Um, and Acrisius is in a cave at the bottom yeah. of a mountain just kind of hanging out. And so I then had another Star Wars thought because of this, because it reminded me of the Wayfinder <laughs> at like mm. Rise of Skywalker, where it's like, you suddenly like take your knife and you line it up and it matches a shipwreck. Oh, yeah. And it's like, oh, here's my coin. It's like the, the same the, kind the of temporal MacGuffin. collapse. Yeah. So, hmm. uh, so yeah. here we go. Here's the, the bunch of coins. Yeah. I was just struck by the by the eagle imagery. So I just wanted to throw some other eagle coins on there uh for discussion um i'd say probably the most similar i mean in terms of kind of form would be perhaps the coin on the far left and the coin on the far right where the you know one at least one wing is kind of extended um but uh you know clearly you know looking at um at ancient greek coins um that depicted the eagle of zeus so and this is also showing me like with the, with the shading, what you were talking about with the dye press. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of course, Zeus's coins are much nicer and more carefully uh, made and minted than the kind of lumpy looking coin that he gives Seraphim, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> um. Uh, so now we're going to shift to the architectural here. If we look at some Olympus. Right. So um, I mean, one of the big problems whenever you're doing like a reception of Olympus is what are you going to make it look like? Um, and, you know, I, I love what they've done here with kind of melding the mountain and the architecture in a way that you might actually see Um on a Greek mountain um, at an actual site. So they've got um, uh, things like the gymnasium at the bottom and um, you know they've got their uh, stadium that's kind of built into the side. Um, the main temple is up at the Acropolis. Uh, and if you contrast that with um, other receptions like um, you know, there is Xanadu where they're basically in a disco club. Um, and I, I'm sure most of the people watching this are not going to have any idea what I'm talking about. It's a really old movie. <laughs> um, Olivia Newton-John and roller skates and disco and stuff. But um, you've got like the Harry House and idea of like a giant Tholos with a game board in the middle. Um, you've got, um, you know, some, some are super futuristic. Some are, you know, obviously much closer to what we would think of as ancient and I think with this Olympus um, they've struck a really good middle ground so uh, we get um, a lot of uh, ancient callbacks they call them rubber stamping because you're basically taking an image out of an existing artwork or building and kind of stamping it onto your scene Um, so we see this a lot in video games where they have a very limited catalog of images but they want to use it to make the scene look more authentic um, so in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, you see the Parthenon freeze on like, you know, five completely different kinds of objects, mm. um, but it's the same picture. Um, and they're doing that here. Um, if you look on the uh, top left picture in the back, we can see um, the center figures of the uh, West Pediment of the Parthenon. Um, so it's um, Poseidon and Athena having the battle over Athens, um, but they kind of cut it off on the other side of the chariots. Um, and, um, then you've got the, uh, the two figures flanking that, which I'm not quite sure what they are. I think they might also be from the pediment, but, um, I can't really get close enough to, to see. Um, but when you start looking at the masonry and stuff, um, it is a lot more finished than we would expect from an actual ancient building. You've got all of these blues in there, um, all of this waterworks and that I, and um, Zoe, David, you, you can kind of um, 
correct me if I'm wrong here, because I know you've played the game as well. I don't know if you have Christian, but it really reminds me of the DLC in Assassin's Creed Odyssey when we finally get. I'm to this close to getting the there. I'm not there yet. I've seen pictures okay. of it from your uh, from okay. your presentation. No so, spoilers yeah. then. But um, yeah. you know this this idea of like really high buildings with um you know this white veined marble, um all these gold accents. Uh, reminds me a lot of Odyssey and this kind of mix in between um, like ancient inspiration and something that would be appropriate to a futuristic society. Because um, most, most people do want to have the gods be more advanced than, you know, the people in regular Greece. Um, you know, that, that's pretty standard. But, um, you know, I, I think that they've struck a good balance um, here with Olympus. Yeah. yeah. I, Zoe. Oh, I was just gonna say I, I totally I totally get what you're saying. I, I hadn't even thought of that connection. Um, but you're totally right with the with the massive waterfalls, like the huge, huge waterfalls. Um, and even kind of these connecting of little smaller peaks together um mm -hmm. with architecture. It's really I like that. Yeah. And you see um we're going to talk a little bit later about Delphi, but like in terms of sites being situated on different different mm -hmm. levels, but the way that they connect it through um, the walls as they kind of ascend and go through there, and so you have that mix of the natural rock formation next to like the technologically um, developed. I love like looking at the masonry of this mm -hmm. stone. I think is really thrilling because you can see these large, almost cyclopean square cut blocks that are there. Yeah, and I think the juxtaposition of the really beautiful, polished, clean marble with the rough hewn rock next to it is is really visually interesting. Um, because they both, I mean, it seems almost it's, you know, someone feels like someone has to have built it, but it also at the same time seems to have just kind of grown naturally out mm -hmm. of the mountain itself and, and become this kind of ethereal luxurious building um yeah and that's something that i thought a lot about which is separate um is thinking about roman conceptions of hellenistic luxuria and um the importance of waterworks specifically in roman villas and and kind of build i mean building for luxury <laughs> basically there's a, a book that i'm referencing uh by zarmakupi when i say that but um uh, this idea that that um, waterworks within your um, within your your home and within kind of the structure that you're spending time with is this inherently luxurious and uh, uh, philosophical almost because you can walk around and you can talk while you listen to the water um, and I really liked that inclusion in Blood of Zeus's Olympus. Hmm. Um, these, these long like Euripi, these long channels and canals of water and and semi-natural water falls and things like that. So they think of the, the Domus Aurea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That makes that, it, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Christian. Oh, I was just saying, that makes this um, confrontation between Zeus and Hera that takes place on this platform all the more striking because rather than it being a quiet philosophical contemplation as you stroll through the Euripilae, Instead, you're confronting each other there in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, so I, I think that your point about um, the architecture fitting into the landscape is um, it's great because it's so characteristic of Greek architecture. Yeah. Um, you know, the Greeks built their cities, their temples to fit into the existing landscape and, you know, to really complement it. Um, whether that was like I'm building up on an Acropolis or fitting into a valley of some sort, um, they really tried to keep that in mind when they were actually designing their buildings. Whereas the Romans just got rid of the landscape. They designed their buildings first. And then, you know, if they had to move like an entire hill in the center of Rome to build Trajan's Forum, they were going to do that. Um, that was fine. If they had to like construct a fake mountain so that they could have a really high temple, they would do that too. Um, landscape was kind of an afterthought. Um, for them. So the fact that we see an environment that's fitting in so well to the actual Mount Olympus um, area is something that is completely Greek. Wonderful. Uh, so moving on maybe to a closer detail about some of the decoration here on Olympus. 
Yeah. Um, I just particularly liked the inclusion of, of not one, but two Artemisian bronze <laughs> statues on kind of flanking. This is, I think the very top of Olympus. Mm -hmm. Um, and in particular when, when Zeus has his, um, I want to say meltdown, but that's just, you know, that's my inherent bias. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a tantrum. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he throws a lot of lightning bolts and gets very yeah. upset, um, as, as you do. <laughs> um, but I thought his, his pose was striking. I mean, we don't get to see a nice kind of one-to-one, -one, um, mimicking, but you know, he's got his, his right arm back with holding his lightning bolt. His other arm is kind of held forward with a hand. His hand is kind of loosely, uh, hanging down from his arm. It's unfortunately not in the screenshot, which is very, very much how you might expect the Artemisian bronze, which of course, you know, we don't know. We don't know if it's Zeus or Poseidon, but, um, uh, you know, the way that Zeus holds himself in that scene feels like the natural next step to uh, what the statue of the Artemisian bronze is depicting, which is, you know, th if it is Zeus throwing a lightning bolt. Mm -hmm. um, so I just particularly liked the framing of the, of the Acropolis of the, of Olympus, and also then the framing of Zeus as these statues as well. And we also get the Artemisian bronze showing up in monumental form um, in Assassin's Creed Odyssey as well, um, quite Odyssey often. The same thing, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Just like the over-the-top statues that mm. don't exist in real life. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, cool. he's beautiful. Yeah. And it's nice because so many of the times, you know, the debate about it is, is it Zeus? Is it um, Poseidon? And then they, we have this conflict kind of between the brothers as well when they're up here. Mm. And then the show actually like has to make a statement. And so... It's nice for a show to like say, here's where we're gonna come down. Might have been interesting to have one of them be Zeus and one of them be mm. Poseidon. Mm. Um, I don't know how they would, you know, get Hades in there, but um, <laughs> with his trident. We're all yeah, we're all waiting for next next yeah. season. Um, yeah. So a couple of but, things that I love about this image is this feels like a very specific marble. Like this mm -hmm. white marble with the black. Like, I feel like you could probably locate where that comes from. I don't know about marble. But then, is this a painted frieze down below? Um, looks like it might be, yeah. That's, uh, I, just, I guess that's just... weird to have on marble like that, but. I'm not, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was kind of like that there was a tier of marble and then there was some rock with some, you know, scrubby plants and then another tier of marble, but Unless, um, maybe it's like a reference to the game board from Harryhausen mm -hmm. um, where they have the gods looking down um, right. on like the mortal world and moving their game pieces around. It, it, like in my, in the other videos, I talk a lot about this. This is full of Harryhausen oh, yeah. references throughout. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a reference to the game board. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah, oh. as for the marble, I, oh, yeah. I'm a bad archaeologist and I don't know my marbles on site. I, I can tell you it's not Perry and Orthasian. Um, that's about it. It's not porphyry. Definitely not porphyry. So that's about yeah. the extent of mine. Yeah. <laughs> so we well, guess I think that keep in mind in the future. Um, all right, so I think this is coming up towards some of the last images that we have here just before... He is assassinated by Seraphim. We have Zeus relaxing in a pool. The, the, the Scarface moment. <laughs> That's what I think. I, I feel like it's, it's like screams like 80s, 80s gangster here. But maybe that's just me. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Googling images of Scarface right now. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, I, I, is, it the, is it like the wide arm spread completely? Yes chill mm -hmm. relax. by yourself in the hot tub yeah mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i pulled these screenshots just because um i saw them and immediately was like ah oh, it's a roman bathhouse <laughs> um which i of course you know uh wasn't expecting to see but it's been interesting kind of speaking with y'all and then poking at it a little more and finding um more and more you know surprise classical and hellenistic greek <laughs> um parallels as well um also this scene was really rough <laughs> it, was, it was not 
pleasant to watch. Yeah, so there's a couple things I think to point out that I, um, I'm struck by because we have the water element here and then around him, we have kind of this wave pattern that we'll be maybe thinking about some more. So it's really a nice, like we were talking about with the architecture of Olympus, this mix between the natural mountain shape, but then also the unnatural um, manipulated form that works together. Here we move from the kind of like the water to the wave and his blood, when they spill the blood of Zeus, will kind of spill across both of those. Let's look at maybe some other elements that this might be quoting. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I thought it was interesting or kind of, we kind of talked about this a little bit before, um, before filming, but um, this plunge pool from the gymnasium complex at Delphi is really interesting, um, especially considering all of the, the um, you know, exercising and things like that that would happen. I mean, A, because of the Delphic Games, but um, specifically with a gym, within a gymnasium con context. Um, and the nice, you know, circular plunge pool here uh, corresponds nicely with the circular pool that Zeus is relaxing in. Um, and uh, specifically, we, we were thinking about those wave, that wave motif, and we... <laughs> thanks to some quick Googling, um, <laughs> found this really lovely pebble mosaic on the right, um, which is uh, the stag hunt mosaic from um, the house of the abduction of Helen um, from Pella. So Macedonian um, and Hellenistic in, or Hellenistic uh, in creation. So this again, potential blending of, um, you know, classical, uh, let's say classical exercise uh, ideals with this um, Hellenistic uh, mosaic motif. And then it also of course made me think of some of the iconic black and white Roman bathhouse mosaics. So on the bottom left, there's a nice um, Poseidon Neptune mosaic from Ostia um, from the Baths of Neptune, um, which of course, you know, long, long post dates um, the Hellenistic and classical periods, but still, I mean, there's a lot more that can be said about the way that Roman art draws on Greek traditions um, for their luxury spaces, so. Uh, um, so I just had an idea because I was thinking about like the roundness, but in this previous shot, we have this round pool, but it has Corinthian columns around it, which reminds me of like the, the round temple, the Tholos mm -hmm. temple or Hercules Victor in Rome. And it's mm -hmm. like, I'm kind of made him put a bath in there. Uh, so we have a few more parallels here to this kind of shape. And I think it's this idea that the octopus tentacle, the way it curls, mimics that wave form. And something that I like about this is because it's going to be an attack and an invasion here. And so it's almost like if we think of like the waves kind of curling in on Zeus, it mm. represents a threat of capture or attack. And the monsters have the tentacles themselves too. Yeah. And um, we know from the production stills that um, the um, octopus lady was modeled after um, the uh, Minoan Mycenaean marine style of authors, um, which we see here, which we're comparing to the waves. So the fact that, you know, Zeus is about to be attacked by A, the octopus lady, um, but you know, be a whole bunch of other giants um, who are coming out of the ocean. Uh, it fits really well um, yeah. with what you're saying, Christian. Death will come to you by the sea. Yeah. Uh, that's actually what this show is act investigating is the sea peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, dun, dun, dun. Next week, Atlantis. Mm -hmm. All right. So before we um, kind of wrap up, I want to give both of you a chance to speak about any issues that you might have lingering, if you do. If you don't, that's fine, but do um, you have any anything you want to share about Blood of Zeus that this is a space for you to do that? Is this because I said I wanted to yell about Hera? Yes. <laughs> um, I guess I, 
I think because I was, um, I have a natural, not a natural affinity for Hera because that would be a great hubris to say that I have any affinity for any of the gods. But um, I guess I was just hoping that there would be a little bit more nuance between kind of the behavior between Hera and Zeus. And um, I mean, I think that this is a point of discussion that's happening a lot in classics right now, specifically with Hades and Persephone. But the way that it manifested in this show in particular was the relationship between Zeus and Electra, Heron's mother, and the scenes where, you know, Zeus takes on the guise of, uh, it's Electra's his mother, right? I'm not just completely. Correct, correct. That's, yes. that's her name, yeah. Phew. Um, uh, when he takes on the guise of Electra's husband and comes down, which is of course very, you know, very Greek and Roman, uh, Greek and Roman in nature to have Zeus taking on the guise of a husband to come down um, and get busy. Um, you know, the way that he manipulates her into falling in love with him as a, as her husband um, with the effect that her husband, you know, she becomes less guarded against her husband and therefore is abused more by him is very manipulative and creepy and bad it's not romantic. I mean, mm -hmm. even though the mm -hmm. show portrays them as having a romantic relationship and being in love and Zeus clearly throughout this show has this deep emotional connection to her. I mean, that's what the show is built on. Um, but I, I, I think, I think that's a, I think that's a broader conversation. The fact that within the context of the show, Zeus's manipulation and preying on a young mortal woman who doesn't know any better is portrayed as romantic. Whereas Hera, who is Zeus's wife, right? So there's already the context of, um, you know, infidelity, of which we know Zeus is guilty of multiple times within this universe in particular, because when Zeus brings Hera on up to Olympus, the other gods say, you know, oh, he's fathered seven bastard children already and whatnot. Um, I mean, Hera is completely demonized for being upset about this. And not only that, she's also portrayed as being much like the Hera from Greek and Roman myth. She's angry at the mortal in addition to Zeus. And of course, you know, when you look at kind of the ancient context, it becomes this like, well, she can't necessarily act out against Zeus so she has to channel her anger against mortals um and I think the show missed an opportunity to do something with that I think it would have been really interesting to have them not turn Hera into the big bad guy for being upset that Zeus preyed on a young, a young innocent woman who didn't know any better um and I think that that I mean that colored my viewing of the entire show. I still really enjoyed it. And clearly there's a lot of parts that I really liked hunting down and doing research on. Um, and I will say there's a lot of things I do like about the way that they do Hera. I love her crow army. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Um, I just, I guess I wanted, I wanted them to do something a little bit different with that. I mean, they've done so much to to kind of refashion the Greek world. Why not? Why not that? Um, but maybe that's just a different show that you know will come out eventually. So, um, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you. Um, that whole relationship between the three of them was incredibly problematic, and I mean, part of me wondered, you know, how much Electra really did love Zeus um, and how much she was just trying to survive the situation is, I mean, if you look right. at it, she's, she doesn't really have a choice uh, right. in any of it. Zeus doesn't ask her uh, if it's okay, if he's there or not, he just comes in, acts like her husband. And then eventually, you know, he's found out, he starts showing up as himself and then he whisks her away, um, you know, to live a life of misery in this hovel outside of, I guess it was Thebes um, where they were living, um, where everyone hates her because they know she was the queen. Um, 
I mean, it's very, very selfish on his part. Um, what I did like about their portrayal between Zeus and Hera is that um, Hera is, um, you know, as, as angry as she is, she's being much more mature about the situation than Zeus is. Um, it's very clear that Zeus is trying to do whatever he wants and flaunt his own rules. And when it does come to a showdown, you know, the only people that are standing beside him are his kids by mortals. Um, you know, he's got, I guess Athena isn't really a kid by a mortal, but, um, you know, she's always with Zeus anyways. And then right. you've got um, Apollo and Artemis um, and pretty much all of the other gods are with Hera. And, you know, beside that, right, tells him, like, dude, these are your rules. You're breaking them. Um, you know, and if you're going to do that, then, you know, we're not going to have your back. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it, it just kind of stops there. Um, I think that, you know, if there were more episodes, if it was a longer show, uh, apparently they're only allowed like 20 pages per episode. Um, so they had to like really, really condense stuff. They, um, cut an entire backstory for Alexia at the very last minute mm, because that would, that the director, nice. yeah, the director literally would not let them keep working the animation studio. <laughs> um, they were already up against a deadline, but, um, you know, I, I, I do think that it, something like that could have been prioritized over say more of, um, the dialogue between, you know, Heron and Zeus or um, the training montage. <laughs> yeah, the training montage. I mean, it's great, but it doesn't need to be that much. Uh, it's not Heron, inward. Movie. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, uh, all that to say, I, I agree with you, Zoe. I think that they did make some progress in how Hera is normally portrayed, but they, they could have and they probably should have taken it farther. So something I think is really important about our conversation is it's so easy to go in and think about plot and character, but the, what you two have really drawn out for me and David and all of our other viewers is look, look past what the characters are doing and saying to what the animators are, what the, what the studio is bringing in, because there's a whole other story that we were able to explore and that you guys helped elucidate for us today. And I think it helps us celebrate more of the production company than just the voice actors and then the, the writers and directors. Yeah, I mean, and the writers, you know, they don't have a lot of input necessarily on how the characters actually end up looking. You know, they can give like a few pointers um, to the animation studio, say, okay, we want to like draw inspiration from Alexander or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the animators who are actually drawing up the stills, getting them approved and you know, blocking out the scenes and actually putting everything together. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I really do think that we need to give a lot more attention to what their restrictions are um, mm -hmm. when we're kind of cutting apart episodes and saying, you know, oh, well, this didn't make it and this should have made it in. Um, you know, A, can you animate that at all? And B, how much is it gonna cost? Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we're still at the, for the vanguard of criticism about Blood of Zeus, a few things exist on the internet, uh, kind of immediate uh, publication. So I want to look at a couple um, items that get drawn out continually. So first of all, it's the animation people will say is great. Um, they, like, they like it, but there's a comparison that gets made in two things that I found today. And those are some references to pottery. Fight scenes. From Heron taking on Cerberus in a random encounter in the finale's all-out brawl between gods and monsters is the stuff pottery painters had in mind. Crimson flows and pours out of bodies like squeezed juice out of tangerines. It happens so often, I wonder how many ounces of red ink the animators used in production. First of all, none because it was digital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I just had to say that. No, so, it's and we are grateful for it. This is from inverse.com. And then the character designs in Blood of Zeus look unlike anything powerhouse animation has done so far with the characters, particularly Heron, looking like they came straight from ancient Greek vases and sculptures, adding to the feel that this story could only be done properly in animation. No. 
No. <laughs> Are you telling anyone else want to talk first? Because I have opinions about this. I think Kira, you should take it for us. Okay. Um, I mean, first of all, yes, it's the stuff pottery painters had in mind. Because if you're going to put one scene out of an entire story on a pot, you're going to make sure it's one with the action in it. And generally, those scenes are going to have a lot of different elements pulled in from the rest of the story so that you can kind of tell the entire thing in your mind. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to be like the peak of the story that ends up on the pot, um, you know, like nine times out of ten. And, you know, that's the same thing that you want in a finale. You don't want people like sitting around, you know, drinking coffee or whatever for 30 minutes as a season finale. That's just not going to work. Um, as far as the blood, um, I, I'm not really sure what they're getting at here. Um, I mean, some of it did remind me a lot of like the sort of blood that we get in Harryhausen with um, the claymation um, more than, say, blood that we see um, on vases. But you know, at the same time, you, you have technical limitations um, as for how well you can depict blood in a Greek vase. Um, and, and as for the characters not looking like anything powerhouse animation has done before, uh, they, they seemed very Castlevania to me. Yeah, um, that, that was strike, that was my introduction. I showed this tra the trailer of it to my myth students, and all of them said, "This looks like Castlevania." Yeah, even yeah, though we had been looking, we had been looking at Greek vases for three months. Yeah. nobody said that looks like Greek vases. They all said that looks like Castlevania. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I look at so many Greek phases and it did not remind me of a single Greek vase at all. So, yeah, I'm calling bullshit on this article. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, but this is, I just want to make a point and like, for our readers, one of the things I'm trying to emphasize with this is not to make fun of these articles, but to say like, mm -hmm. we've really tried to spend time taking this show in a really serious way um, instead of just making broad statements. David or Zoe, do you have anything, any thoughts about comparisons to pottery? I mean, I'll come out in defense of my thesis that they all have Alexander the Great hair, and that's from a statue, <laughs> but I mean, statue at all. But um, yeah, I, I agree with all all that Kara said. I think I think this flattens it a lot, mm -hmm. um, which, of course, you know, similar to how we're talking about, you know, there are limitations in terms of what you can afford to have animators do. There's limitations in terms of what you can put in your script and things like that. But um, Similarly, you know, if you're writing up a hype piece, you're not necessarily going to be interested in tracking down, you know, archaeologists to tell you what are actually on ancient pots, which I, you know, valid. <laughs> um, but uh, it certainly, I think it flattens a lot of the artistic nuance because I, that's one thing that's uh, indisputable about Blood of Zeus is that there's a lot of artistic nuance throughout the entire show. Um, so. And I mean, I, I do wonder, um, you know, with articles like this, how much ancient art they've actually been exposed to. Mm, I mean, if yeah. you are like picking up, you know, a general audience myth book, it's probably going to have a pot in the front. Um, <laughs> most sources mm -hmm. are going to be using ancient pots as their quote unquote ancient illustration. Um, so, I mean, if the author is thinking, you know, this looks like a lot of the ancient stuff I've seen. Um, you know, for them, that, that's probably going to be pottery. Um, yeah, it's striking though to make, if you're making both this statement about pottery, but then this statement about animators, I'm yeah. going to be inclined to doubt all of your <laughs> awareness yeah. of either one. Um, so I did grab two images with blood on them. So this is Achilles slaying Penthesilea. There we go. A little bit of a splurt from the neck, which is what happens to kind of Zeus. Um, and then the um, Euphronius crater with the death of uh, Sarpedon. And here, maybe this is the like the tangerine squeezing out. So if you poke a bunch of holes in the tangerine, <laughs> you squeeze Sarpedon's body. Poor Sarpedon. <laughs> um, but I. So yes. I mean, I think I think even even with these two examples that you've picked, they're. I mean, yes, they have blood, but. I think even that kind of disproves the the assertion that that bloody gore is what 
you know, ancient pottery artists had in mind because for both of these, it's not about, I mean, yes, someone has died and yes, it was, they died in war. And so therefore it's gruesome, but they're about human connections, right? So they're about this Achilles Penthesilea eyeball gaze thing and this this idea of of them falling in love at first you know they mm-hmm. he's killing her and falls in love at the same time or with Sarpedon I mean you've you've got um I mean Sarpedon the son of Zeus huh yeah. um <laughs> dying and Zeus's emotions and dealing with that in the Iliad um which you know for better or worse, you can you can read this as relating to that story. Of course, there's lots of debate about that, but um, you know the gore of both of these scenes is not the not the main point. Mm-hmm. The point is the emotion behind both of these stories. Um, and so, even then, even if you've picked out you know bloody scenes from vase painting, um, it's not you know murder porn. Yeah, and that seems to be like because uh, the connection that we've talked about, David and Amy and I in the past, is it's much more like an Iliadic battlefield where yeah. you're following yeah. a weapon through space as it enters a limb or moves, severs a body part. Uh, yeah, so all what, of those um, like through the jaw death scenes. Mm-hmm. I was like, ooh, that's some that's some Homer stuff yeah. right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. We've now spent three episodes, and I'm grateful for you viewers for watching with us, um, really kind of look at this Blood of Zeus, these 10 episodes or eight episodes from kind of a historical standpoint, um, like in terms of myth, but a literary standpoint and a literary approach. And today we did a material cultural approach. Uh, another commonplace comes up in people writing about this on the internet that we have not touched upon, and that's music. And so I kind of want to close today by just saying this is another avenue that exists, one that we haven't touched um, and we don't have the expertise to discuss, but I wanna share this with you and then we will uh, say farewell. So the emphasis here is on the score. The score full of triumphant horns and confident brass would not be out of place in a classic Hollywood sword and sandals epic like William Wyler's Ben-Hur, lending the series of gravitas and importance that is almost non-existent in its characterization and story. So this person was not a big fan of character and story in, the, in it. That's then, brutal. It also, this is our, our friend from the Thrillist earlier. It also helps that the action is complemented by an appropriately theatric orchestral score that highlights the grand nature of Heron's journey. That the music also incorporates astonishing choral chants adds to the feel of a mythical movie of old, like Ben-Hur or Jason and the Argonauts, while the animation makes the show feel intense enough that it simply couldn't be replicated in live action. So one of the things that I hope we've done in this series is move from making broad, generalized statements of feeling to very specific connections uh, to show our respect toward what the creators of Blood and Zeus have done at every level of the production. And so I would like to thank uh, Kira and Zoe for coming on and joining me and David this evening. Great, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.